Okay, wow. Here we are, February and early March 1990. And who boy, this episode is a real gem. I was only familiar with a couple of these games, but the names look kind of interesting, like Destination Earthstar? However, no. This episode is 100% garbage. There's not much of redeeming value here, but at least one game is kind of fascinating just based on the concept alone. So a couple things I need to point out. In episode 54, I covered Super Sprint, the Atari racing game, and someone pointed out that Super Sprint was already in episode 40, something I have absolutely no recollection of. Also, I missed A Boy and His Blob, which was released in January 1990, but I had it down as January 1991. So Wizardry got booted from this episode, and we'll start off by getting caught back up with A Boy and His Blob. So sorry about that, Wizardry fans, all three of you. Alright, so let's get started. Alright folks, here's the weird game this episode. It's a popular game from a major publisher that is unlike almost anything else released on the console at that time. But I don't necessarily mean that as a compliment. It's a game that feels both experimental and surprisingly amateurish, or at the very least, it feels rushed. David Crane's The Boy and His Blob, Trouble in Blobonia, is the first of two games this episode, with overly long, campy titles that are meant to evoke old science fiction serials or pulp stories. Against my better judgment, I played all the way through this game, but luckily you can beat this pretty quickly if you know what to do. So after the weird faux Raiders of the Lost Ark title screen and music, the game starts you out with no intro, no cutscenes, nothing. The game just starts. You're a boy, and you have a blob. Exploring the upper level, we find a subway entrance, and at the far right end, a health food store. It's emblematic of a boy and his blob that of the eight screens we've traveled through, most of them are completely empty and serve no purpose other than to show off the backgrounds, which were clearly derived from photographs. Alright, so we've explored the upper level, so let's go down the stairs to the subway, which is also empty and appears to be a dead end. So, how do people get on the train, David? So, here's where the Blob comes in. His full name is Blobbert, of course, and he likes jelly beans. Now, I'll point out in this game, there is no, like, in-game storytelling at all. Everything is explained only in the manual. Throwing jelly beans at the blob will cause him to change his shape. Each flavor of jelly bean will change him to something else. An umbrella, for example. Now, neither the game nor the manual tell you what flavor does what. And I would actually recommend writing all of them down so you don't waste jelly beans by feeding the blob the wrong flavor. There is a sort of logic to the bean names, like vanilla and umbrella both end in LLA, or punch jelly beans changes the blob into a hole, like a hole punch. The manual basically just tells you that you need to explore underground caverns and find treasure, which you can then use to purchase vitamins at the vitamin store. You will then use these vitamins to defeat the evil emperor of Blobonia in the second half of the game. Now the part about the vitamins turns out to be completely untrue, as we'll discuss later, but the point is the game gives you almost no guidance beyond explore the caves, and encourages you to experiment. And while experimentation in video games is great, in this case it mostly just means trial and error. For example, entering the caverns. Clearly you'll need to use the punch jelly bean to get the blob to turn into a hole, However, using the hole on the left side of the tunnel, or the far right side of the tunnel, will result in you just falling to your death. Now 
Now there is a platform in the middle section of the tunnel that you can safely put a hole in and land and grab some treasure, as long as you don't put the hole above the subway serpent, in which case you'll land on him and get killed. Using the trampoline is quite similar. You can use it to jump very high up to reach platforms that are higher than the ladder can go. Often you'll need to jump up several screens and then land on a platform. But again, trial and error. You need to position the trampoline in exactly the right spot so that you'll end up right next to the ledge and land on it. And despite me throwing around words like experimentation, there's pretty much only one tool that can be used to allow you to, to go forward whenever you reach a certain type of obstacle. For reaching higher ledges, it's the trampoline. For dropping down one floor, it's the hole. And for jumping off high ledges, it's the umbrella, which allows you to gently float down to the ground below. The caverns are pretty big. Here's a map of the whole area. But quite a lot of it is just empty space, and it's relatively linear. You enter on the right-hand section of the cavern, go down a few floors, at the bottom head to the left-hand side. You can skip the lake completely, and then just use the ladder and trampoline to get back up to the top where you exit from a manhole. There's nothing really that interesting in the caverns. I mean, it's not like Zelda or Symphony of the Night where you find cool items by exploring. I mean, there's just treasure, which is, once again, completely useless. But the issue here is there's really not much to do in the caverns other than find your way around without getting killed a lot. David Crane was, of course, a well-known designer of Atari 2600 games and then later computer games, and at its core, A Boy and His Blob is just a really big 2600 game with better graphics. Its obvious predecessor was Crane's Pitfall 2 from 1984. Much like A Boy and His Blob, Pitfall 2 had you exploring a huge underground cavern filled with deadly bats and scorpions that you needed to avoid. Much like the sewer snakes in a boy in his blob, you can't attack these creatures directly. You just need to make sure that they don't touch you as they roam around. The stated goal of Pitfall 2 is to collect a few useless items stashed around the caverns, but the real point of the game is just running around and exploring, swimming through lakes, falling down holes in the floor, or just jumping off ledges to see where you'll end up at. Once you find the final item that you're looking for, the game just ends. No final boss, no congratulations screen, it just stops. And Blob's gameplay style, experimentation with very little guidance as to what to do or where to go, actually harkens back to older games like Raiders of the Lost Ark on the 2600. An utterly baffling game that gives you a few items like a bullwhip and a flute, and places you into a relatively open world and just says, okay, beat the game. It's like a Sierra adventure game with no text. As kids, we had no idea what to do with this thing, other than just wandering around aimlessly. Until one day, an older kid showed us the very specific steps you had to take to beat it. Looking at a boy and his blob from this perspective might give some context to the game's lack of hints or guidance or the surprisingly anticlimactic boss fight. The game was pretty successful, I believe, and received a little known sequel for the Game Boy. A modern day remake or reimagining of A Boy and Its Blob was released for the Wii. This version is much more normal. The characters are cuter, it gives you more direction and clues about what to do. It's designed to be a lot more intuitive. You pick up new types of jelly beans as you progress through the game, rather than starting with all of them like you do in the NES game. It tells you what the jelly beans do when you select them. I think most people would probably enjoy this a bit more than the original, but it is a very different game. This way! Alright, so I mentioned earlier that the only thing to do in the caverns is to collect treasure. The number at the top of the screen tells you how many pieces of treasure you have left. And I said earlier the treasure is absolutely useless, but there is one thing in the caverns that you must get. This bag contains a bunch of jelly beans. Very helpful if you're running low on certain flavors, but it also gives you a new flavor, lime, which is needed to finish the game later on.
So here, if you give Blobbert an apple jelly bean, he'll turn into a jack and pop open the manhole, and you can now exit the cavern. And then I suppose you would go to the health food store, trade in the treasure for vitamins, very expensive vitamins apparently, Alright, so now what? Well, we use a root beer jelly bean and Blobbert turns into a rocket and flies to Blobonia. And we now begin the second section of the game, which is much shorter and completely linear. Okay, so all you do here is you walk from left to right through several screens until you find these guys. Now hypothetically you would use your vitamin gun to shoot these dudes. Remember, all the treasure you collected was spent buying those vitamins. They're sort of like bullets in the game. Though instead of the gun, you can just use the coconut. All the coconut does is roll. However, once you exit a screen via the right hand side, if you turn around and re-enter that previous screen, all of the enemies are now gone permanently. So you just roll the coconut past the enemies, then call the blob back to you, and he'll clear all the screens of all the enemies. And honestly, I can't tell if this was intended or if it's just some kind of bug. Though if this wasn't something that was put in on purpose, then what the hell is the coconut for? So finally you enter the evil emperor's lair, which is like a red brick schoolhouse building. This doesn't even really look like an alien planet to me. You need to trampoline up this machine and turn it off so it stops the marshmallows or whatever from falling on you. Then you get the only really difficult enemy in the game, these teeth that move randomly, and you have to run through them. And then you have to do this again a few screens later. Just like all the enemies in this game, you don't fight them, you don't engage them in battle or anything, you just need to get past them. The design philosophy here is enemies as obstacles. Okay, so basically we're done here. Uh, this is where you use the lime jelly bean. It turns the blob into a key so you can unlock this door. If you don't have the lime jelly beans, then I suppose you can fly back to Earth and get it. Now for the boss, and you're probably not going to like this. It's not a boss battle in any normal sense. I mean, the Emperor doesn't even move. He's just part of the, the background. You need to knock over that jar of vitamins above his head. This is done by feeding the blob an apple jelly bean. However, that large rock is in your way, so you must run in order to throw the jelly bean further than normal. Also, there is a delay between hitting the throw button and when the jelly bean actually leaves your hand, so it'll take a few tries to get the timing just right. Once this happens, you've won. And don't expect any cutscenes or anything fancy like that. A Boy and His Blob is a weird game, and it's only gotten weirder since its release. Its gameplay style would have felt somewhat familiar to someone who'd grown up playing the Atari 2600 or early computer games, but if you pick it up now for the first time, its aimlessness, its lack of any in-game clues, the fact that it's split into two almost completely unrelated parts, all this makes it feel off somehow. The intervening 30 years of video game development has led us to expect certain things, and a boy and his blob simply has no interest in giving us any of those things.
All right, so picking up February 23rd, we have Kitaretsu Dayaka from Epoch, the same guys who made that pinball baseball game a couple episodes ago. You'll recall that Epoch had produced several consoles themselves, like the Cassette Vision, before finally giving up and making games for the Famicom. Now, when I first saw the box art for this game, I immediately thought, wait a sec, I know I've covered a game based on this anime. This looks so familiar. Was it that Mega Drive game that came out right after the console launched? Eventually, it turned out that no, this is the first game based on the Kitaretsu property. It began as a manga in the 1970s, and later an animated TV series ran for several years in the 80s and 90s. The characters were actually created by Fujiko Fujio, the same team that produced Doraemon. Someone described Kitaretsu to me as being Doraemon with the serial numbers filed off. Some online sources claim that an English version of the cartoon was released as Kevin and Budster, but I couldn't find any evidence of this actually existing, so it's probably just an internet urban legend. As you can see, this is a pretty unappealing looking side-scrolling platformer. This was never released in the US, but luckily for all you masochists out there, there is an unofficial English translation which allows us to enjoy the game's story. So Kitaretsu, the main character, is some sort of super smart inventor kid. He has a little robot buddy who is definitely not Doraemon, and some friends that include a girl and a fat kid. He invents a machine that allows one to travel to the world of dreams, and his dumbass friends activate it, so now Kitaretsu has to go to the dream world and rescue them. Now this game is very Mario-esque, and even has an underwater level that is ripped straight out of Super Mario Bros. However, it does include a rather interesting mechanic where you can reverse gravity and walk on the ceiling. This idea would be used in another, much better game, which we'll encounter later in 1990. So one thing you have to do here is collect gold. This will be used for creating inventions. You do this by pressing the A button really fast to fill up the bar. The whole button pressing thing seems pretty unnecessary to me, but you will need these inventions to make progress in most cases. Like here, for example, you need to build this shrink ray to get your girlfriend out of the house. After she's back to normal size, she'll join you on your quest. The game is mostly linear, but there are some areas that are sort of hidden. Like this total knockoff of the Super Mario Bros. underwater levels, except the underwater physics are very different and it's pretty hard to control your characters while you're swimming. Now one very clever thing that I actually did like was that when you run out of lives you are sent to hell and can borrow extra lives. You can of course only do this so many times before you get a game over, but it's a clever way of employing the concept of lives in a video game. Now don't get me wrong, despite having some cute ideas, this is not a good game. Probably the worst thing about it is trying to control multiple characters at once. When they move, they're not quite in sync, and this makes jumping incredibly troublesome. It's very common to jump and have one character land safely and have the other fall to their death. Make no mistake, I absolutely hated this game. It's also pretty hard on the eyes. With ugly textures and busy backgrounds, the whole game just feels like a lot of random bullshit. Fill In Cafe was involved in this to some extent, they appear to have done the sound. Later, two more Kitaretsu games were released for the Game Boy and the Super Famicom, and then the cartoon series ended in 1996, and the world has fortunately been Kitaretsu free since then. Don't worry though, for all you licensed game lovers, we have another anime game coming up later this episode. Oh boy, here we go. Ningen Heiki, Dead Fox, from Capcom. 
which literally translates to human weapon, dead fox. And just so you know, this is not exactly top tier Capcom. It's middle tier at best, and I suspect you'll hate this game if you ever try playing through it. Now, of course, this was released outside of Japan as Codename Viper. I guess Viper sounds more badass in English than Dead Fox. Now, one thing that is rather odd is the copyright on the US version saying 1989, while the Japanese version says 1990, despite Codename Viper being released in March, one year after the Japanese release. Possibly this was created for the US market in 1989, but the release got delayed until 1990 for some reason. Who knows? This opening cutscene raises a number of questions, most notably, is he wearing pants? His legs are flesh-colored, so it's not hard to interpret this as meaning he's wearing a jacket and boots and nothing else. Also, what is that little blob of pixels near his waist supposed to be? A gun? He fires from his other hand. Also, why would he be pointing his gun barrel at his superior officer while being briefed? One interesting thing, Commander Jones seems to have pioneered the use of standing desks. I mean, just look at how tall those desks are in the background. Alright, so we've got to destroy seven drug cartel bases. This is done by A, shooting everyone we see, B, freeing any captives you find, and C, getting grenades from a captured fellow soldier. Why doesn't the army just give you grenades? I mean, they give you a gun. I'm sure that the army could spare a few grenades. So the main novelty in Codename Viper is the spinning doors. When you stand in front of them, the door will revolve, sometimes revealing a captive or ammo. Many times, there's nothing in the door at all. But the doors come in useful because they can also be used to temporarily hide from enemy projectiles. Enemies seem to walk around somewhat randomly, so they will often just walk away while you're using the revolving doors. One, and only one, door contains the grenades, so you must find that door in order to exit the level. Once you reach the end of the level, you will automatically throw the grenade that you have. Unless you don't have the grenades, of course, then you'll need to turn back and keep looking for them. Between levels, you have like a little campfire cookout with this guy who appears to be decoding a letter from the drug cartel. You know these guys are badass because they sign their letters with like little drawings of a skull with an eye patch. And then it's on to the next level, and quite frankly, all the levels here are pretty much the same. I mean, they all have different themes, like there's a jungle level, a military camp level, a high-tech research lab level. Each has slightly different hazards, but they all feel very similar with a few minor exceptions. Codename Viper doesn't have the variety of something like Strider or Mega Man. It feels pretty samey throughout the entire game, and it's actually a bit repetitive. I mean, sometimes you're jumping onto cliffs, sometimes it's metal crates, and sometimes it's on ancient ruins, but every level feels very similar. Now, one unusual thing, the guy with the bombs is placed in an apparently randomized location that changes every time you play. So you really do need to check every door until you find the grenades. And I guess the question arises, why didn't the drug cartel guys search him and find the grenades? According to the intro, the uh, commando was injured and captured, and that's who you're looking for. But are we to understand this somehow happened seven times, once in each base? Seven different grenade-carrying commandos got captured? That's actually pretty lucky for you, because without those commandos' grenades, you'd never be able to finish the game. Now, as you may know, Codename Viper is pretty derivative of Rolling Thunder, a Namco arcade game from 1986, which also involved opening a lot of doors, but which also had weirder looking enemies and was pretty damn annoying. This got a port to the Famicom in March 1989, and this port was actually changed in a lot of ways. I covered it in Crontendo 43, and I barely remember it other than the weird cutscenes where the bad guys did, like, industrial dance moves while watching their girlfriend get raped, I guess, on their big screen TV. Anyway, so things that I don't like about this game, aside from its extreme simplicity and repetitiveness, it's very hard, often in a non-fun way. I mean, Mega Man was hard in creative ways. Codename Viper is hard because enemies continuously appear on the edge of the screen and instantaneously fire at you. Enemies move around and fire in what feels like random patterns. I found myself kind of inching forward when moving through the levels so I wouldn't be shot in the face by surprise. 
Just like in Matumu Abunai Deka, you have to constantly crouch to avoid enemy bullets, which is something that I personally don't really like in games. Also, the platforming is awful. I had to try this section multiple times because in mid-jump the damaging slime might fall down and hit you. It's hard to explain if you haven't played it, but the jumping is actually pretty terrible in this game. If you're too close to the edge of the platform when jumping, you'll just sort of fall off the platform instead of jumping correctly. You need to jump while you're sort of in the center of the platform. Now there is some cool stuff in the last couple levels, like these elevators that move you from floor to floor, but none of this makes up for the game's monotony. There's no boss fights or interesting items or any in-game dialogue except for the cutscenes at the beginning and the end, and of course the guy with the campfire who always just says this one line over and over again. By the second to last level, the guy has deciphered almost the entire letter. The plan is to supply drugs to blank, who can be found at his home in blank. Hmm, who could this mysterious figure be? Well, there's literally only one other character in the game aside from you and the campfire guy, so it's not very hard to figure this out. The last cartel base is probably the most interesting. It has various spiky floors and conveyor belts. I mean, it's not really good, but at least it throws in a bit of variety. Alright, so the guy in charge of the drug cartel is... Commander Jones! Wow! I definitely did not see that one coming. So you head to his mansion, and then suddenly you're in a Castlevania game. And you have to avoid lightning strikes? Does Commander Jones control the weather? Once you've climbed up Jones's tower, you face off with him for the shortest boss fight of all time. You just start shooting at each other, and whoever dies first, loses. It's helpful to duck and to have the rifle, which I didn't have. We both died at the same time, which apparently counts as a win. For me, this seems like a very low-grade Capcom game, and one of the least interesting Capcom games for the NES. Codename Viper feels like something that was intended for the arcades, but ended up on the console instead. It has a very arcadey feel to it. Obviously, some people like this, but I'm saying Codename Viper should be thrown into the dustbin of history. I promised you another anime game, and here it is. Please note, the animated intro shown here is probably the coolest part of the game. Akumakun, Make no Wana, is a rather bizarre JRPG from the powerhouse team of Bandai and Toza. It's basically about a kid who can summon demons and uses them to fight other demons. If that reminds you a little bit of Megami Tensei, well, you're not wrong, but this is a much different game. It's a pretty stripped-down RPG of sorts, and doesn't seem to have entered the pantheon of classic Famicom role-playing games. Your character here is the titular Akumakun, a kid who for some reason was born with demon-summoning powers. As the Wikipedia entry Riley states, Akumakun wants to create a world where all human beings can live happily, and he believes that harnessing the power of demons is necessary for him to achieve this goal. I don't know, kid. That sounds like a bad idea to me. And this, of course, was based on... That's right, a manga and anime. Several different Akuma comic series were published in the 60s and 70s, but this game is specifically based on the Toei animated series from the late 80s, early 90s. Akuma-kun's creator, Shigeru Mizuki, is mostly known for Gegege no Kataro. 
another supernatural themed comic, which Bandai and Toza also made into a video game in 1985. You might remember it as Ninja Kid, as it was retitled for the US version. Now, while a lot of Famicom RPGs have been fan translated, Akuma Kun only has a very partial translation, mostly menus and some dialogue. As I mentioned earlier, this is pretty strange as JRPGs go, and I apologize for all the ugly, untranslated text in here. You start in Hell Village. This place looks pretty dead, if you ask me. There's the house of Dr. Faust, who will save your game, and there's a magic store where you can't buy any, like, decent spells as of yet, but later you'll need to purchase some stuff here. You can also travel to, I guess this is Tokyo, where you live with your parents. In Tokyo, you can rest as your house, so it acts as like a free inn, but there's really nothing else to do in Tokyo. Unlike most JRPGs where you have like a top-down view of each town, here you can only walk horizontally left or right, and there's not really any interactions of note with the townspeople. Exiting to the overworld doesn't really do much either. You are pretty much trapped on the island of Japan for the beginning of the game, and apparently there are no other cities of note in Japan beyond Tokyo. So, before you can leave Japan, you need to defeat Cerberus, who is waiting for you in one of the rooms in Helltown. However, he's way too powerful for you, so you need to go next door to this training room, where you just fight random groups of monsters over and over again in order to level up. And I almost, but not really, appreciate the way this game strips all the pretenses from the JRPG formula. There's no exploring or adventure here as a, a mechanism that explains why you're fighting monsters. You just enter an empty room, fight a battle, exit the room, and then re-enter and repeat this over and over again. Your battles are performed in the usual fashion. You yourself have little offensive power at the moment, but you do have eight minions you can summon. Once you summon, they will fight on your behalf until they lose their hit points or the battle is over. The default setting is that they will fight automatically each turn, but you can control them manually if you want. Though this makes each battle even longer. And let me tell you, the battles are long and monotonous compared to something like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy. At level 1, your minions will typically do about one point of damage when they attack which means that every battle is going to last a few rounds. In addition to this, for every battle, you need to manually select which minions you want to summon, and then each minion appears one by one on the screen. There's also a summoning animation uh, that thankfully can be skipped, but regardless, battles are slow compared to most other JRPGs. Oh yes, and most of the enemies you fight at this point will give you one experience point. Once you've leveled up a few times and gotten enough money to purchase some magic, you will be able to fight Cerberus. A walkthrough I found recommended to get to level 4 to do this, which requires 100 experience points. And remember, most battles give you between 1 and 3 experience points. I was able to beat him at uh, level 3, thankfully. Oh, and please note that unlike some JRPGs, here Cerberus has all three of his heads. So once he's defeated, Dr. Faust opens up a cave, which will allow you to travel under the ocean to the mainland. At this point, Akuma Kun becomes more like a normal JRPG. You wander around, fight random battles, which are apparently infrequent based on the time that I played this, and there will also be a few towns with shops, but not really many people to talk to. There's apparently not really a whole lot of content in this game. There's only around four bosses, I believe, and it's relatively short. It's able to be beaten in just, like, several hours. Though the final boss looks like an enormous slog. In the video playthrough I found, the boss fight took about a half hour. So I suppose this falls somewhere between, like, a standard JRPG like Dragon Quest and old-school computer RPGs like Wizardry, with its emphasis on combat and de-emphasis on things like exploring towns and talking to NPCs. It's an odd game, and not a good game as far as I can tell. I'm sure there are far worse RPGs on the Famicom, but this feels far too boring to actually play, and its lack of a full translation is probably no loss.
All right, so we jump from Toza to Athena, the minds behind such classics as Family Quiz and Butter, two games we covered earlier, but I'm sure you don't remember. I certainly don't. Now one thing I can tell you, the intro is cool. So a dragon kidnapped a lady, as dragons often do, and you have to rescue her. Now so far, so good. This looks kind of like Castlevania. Trust me though, you will be disappointed. Dragon Unit was apparently considered to be slick enough to get a US release by SATA under the name Castle of Dragon, which is just about a name as Dragon Unit. The backstory is told in the manual. Your name is Gerardin, and apparently the evil dragon Darklaza has kidnapped this princess that you were supposed to marry. Well, technically she was kidnapped by Darklaza's son, Dragon Cub. Also, the princess's father is named King Boros. He doesn't turn up in the game itself, but gets several mentions in the manual, and was considered important enough to actually have a drawing of him in there as well. And let me tell you, the art in the Castle of Dragon manual is definitely a trip. So this game is like Castlevania, except that it's awful? So there really aren't a whole lot of enemies here, but the game loves to toss in lots of what feel like mini-bosses at you. Like this guy, who is just obnoxious. Whenever you hit him, he disappears and then reappears from off-screen, which feels like a bug, but I think probably it wasn't. A lot of the fights involve a single enemy who comes rushing at you. You try to hit him a couple times and then back up or jump over him and then just keep repeating. And then you also get a few mostly harmless enemies like bats flying across the screen. The meter on your left is your health bar and the one on your right is your XP. When it fills up, your life bar gets longer. Also, fairies will fly across the screen and if you jump to touch them, your health will be refilled. Dragon Unit is hypothetically a port of a 1989 arcade game of the same name. The arcade game was much more a, of a frantic beat-em-up with multiple enemy types on screen at once and constant weapon and armor drops, as well as screaming metal music. Enemies move horizontally in either a foreground lane or a background lane. You yourself can move from lane to lane freely. There's also some awkward platforming sequences. I don't think Dragon Unit made a very big splash at the arcades, and the NES port only resembles the arcade game in the most superficial ways. I suppose maybe they thought the name and concept would translate well into a home game? Overall, the game is weird and inconsistent. Like the first enemy in Heresy Forest is this weird little thing that rushes at you super quick and starts draining your health and will knock off several life bars. It's just a really strange way to start a level. And then you get a whole bunch of really weak monsters and some awful platforming. The first two levels are really short and the remaining section, Dark Laws's Castle, is much longer. At some point you will get a mace, which is a huge game changer since it knocks enemies back a bit. So most enemies can't just bum rush you and start draining your health by touching you. So you still can be knocked around by certain types of enemies, even if you hit them with a mace. So Castle of Dragon seems like a pretty unfair game in a lot of ways. And you might ask, how many lives do you have? Well, here's the kicker. You have one life. Yes, you die one time and it's game over. Considering how easy it is to get knocked off a pillar or something and fall to your death, this is a pretty bizarre decision. There are three boss battles in this game and they're all very similar. The chicken-headed thing is supposed to be Quetzalcoatl. They all move in a very similar pattern and you need to position yourself so that the shield blocks their fireballs and then move underneath the boss to avoid them stomping on you and then attacking them by jumping and hitting them on the head. Oh, and did I mention that there are these random bursts of thunder and lightning that occur every few seconds, which gets very tiresome. So Castle of Dragon is a pretty confusing game. 
I mean, the art is pretty good, the music is okay in places, it just makes so many unscrutable decisions. For every cool thing in the game, it has like nine random awful things. It's almost impossible to imagine playing through this without save states. The game itself doesn't give you any information as to what's going on, there are no cutscenes or dialogue or any explanation of what's happening. And this probably adds to the overall feeling that it's just a bunch of random crap going on here. But what you actually need to do is collect several items from the various floors of the castle before you can face Dark Laza. The final level has this pretty cool mirror effect, which of course leads to you facing your exact double. The final boss, who is just a bigger, more annoying version of the first two bosses, has a sneaky catch. You can only use the sword to attack him, and you will die if you lose your armor. You have sort of a double life bar in this game. If the life bar is depleted once, you will lose your armor, and if it's depleted a second time, you'll actually die. Except in this boss battle, in which you instantly die if you lose your armor for some reason. At the end, you walk down the hall and you meet your friend, the princess. However, this game has one last little twist. Before she actually appears, you can enter in a secret code. Basically, this involves holding down most of the buttons on the controller, and the princess will then appear topless. Hubba hubba. So Castle of Dragon is not a fun game. It's pretty damn frustrating and just feels thrown together with no rhyme or reason. Oh boy, here we go again. One of the two non-Japanese releases in February, Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum, is published by Data East, but developed by... Beam Software. Granted, this game is not back to the future. It's not that irritating, but I can say that after watching this video, you probably aren't going to run out and grab a copy of this. So, in the cutscene, Dash rolls up in his 1956 Buick or whatever. There's this giant rocket, and the screen flashed a few times. I suppose the game takes place inside the rocket. The manual is pretty unclear about what's happening. It says you've just landed a thousand light years from home, on an alien planet filled with strange creatures, deadly force fields, and dangerous pitfalls. And your goal is to make your way through this incredible maze of rocket rooms and elevator shafts and return safely to your ship. So maybe this is an alien ship we're in? Though sometimes you enter a room and you'll be suddenly outside? To make matters more confusing, the back of the box says you've landed in the mental ward of the galaxy, the alien asylum, and that you need to destroy overlords in the control complex. So there's really not a whole lot of thought or consistency when it comes to the story of this game. So regardless of whatever this game is apparently about, Dash Galaxy is sort of a mixture of a uh, Sokoban-style block-pushing puzzle game and an impossible mission-style action platformer. So there's a few things you can pick up in this game, bombs and other helpful items, and if you look at the bottom of your screen, it will show your inventory. You can carry keys, bombs, detonators, and stars. The hearts just show you how many lives you have left, and the stars will give you temporary invincibility once you collect, I think, 10 of them. So you start off on floor 00. There are 25 floors total and about 100 rooms in the entire game. When you enter a room, the door is locked, and you then have to press several switches in the room to open the door again so you can leave. Now you might ask, if you're just going to leave, what's the point of entering the room? Well, for 90% of the rooms, the answer is absolutely nothing. You can just skip them. One could almost say the only way to win this game is not to play. Now, the actual goal here is to get to the top floor, and you can just walk right into the elevator shaft and go to the next floor in most cases. On some floors, there might be something blocking the elevator shaft, so you'll need to use a bomb or a key. 
and in the upper levels you are required to find a few hidden doors in order to proceed on to the next level. A few things about this remind me of Boy and his Blob. Obviously one is that you can just skip whole sections of the game. The other is you don't really engage enemies much, Dash doesn't have laser guns or weapons other than bombs, and enemies don't actually attack you. They typically just walk or fly back and forth across the screen, and you might need to jump over them or wait for them to pass before moving forward. Also, both games seem very invested in trying to give the game protagonist some sort of feeling of realistic physics. I mean, for example, the boy had that thing where he would do a little skid across the ground when he stopped running, and that annoying little wind-up when he threw a jelly bean. Dash Galaxy feels sort of influenced by Prince of Persia. There's a lot of little subtle changes to his sprite as he moves. Like when you hold down the, uh, the D-pad while running for a couple seconds, Dash will change from a walk to a run. And he doesn't just speed up, his whole posture changes. When doing a running jump, he stretches his arms out in front of him, and when landing after a high jump or fall, he bends his knees to soften the impact. Compare this to, say, Batman Sprite from a couple episodes ago. I mean, his cape flaps in the wind, but his torso remains completely still as he ducks and jumps. This interest in physics might explain why the game is basically centered around trampolines and jumping. One does not normally associate science fiction with trampolines, and the fact that you spend so much time jumping on trampolines makes one suspect that maybe this was originally planned to be a completely different game. The actual physics here are pretty strange and will take some getting used to. For example, to jump higher, you would assume you would do a running jump. That's like a video game law, right? However, here, a running jump makes you do like a low-flying leap forward. To jump high, you have to walk slowly or stand still, jump straight up, and then push the D-pad while in midair. And there are some very odd things. Instead of health, you have oxygen, which slowly runs out but also gets depleted when an enemy touches you. I guess this makes sense, but you refill your oxygen by picking up Erlenmeyer flasks? which obviously can hold liquid, but not gas. I mean, why didn't they draw the sprites as oxygen tanks or something? Or as I mentioned earlier, some parts simply don't make much sense. Despite the entire game supposedly taking place inside a rocket ship, some areas are clearly set outside. Many of the levels don't look like they were designed with a rocket ship in mind, and use tiles that look like stone blocks. And these sort of old-fashioned looking doors look very out of place inside a rocket ship. I mean, there's like a few metal textures in the game and some robot enemies, but I can only assume the levels were mostly designed before the sci-fi theme was added. And the block-pushing areas seem to be have added on later, since they have a very clear futuristic look to them. Should you actually finish the game, you might be disappointed that there is no final battle with the overlords in the control complex. In fact, there is no control complex or overlords mentioned anywhere except on the back of the box. When you exit the final door on the top floor, you simply get a message that says, Mission complete, dash, and then congratulations with like a dozen exclamation points after it. And then it just returns to the title screen. Even though I really dislike this game, at least Dash Galaxy has a somewhat unusual concept and execution. Our next game, however, is a whole nother ball of wax. Okay, if Dash Galaxy wasn't bad enough for you, here's Destination Earth Star. I gotta admit, it takes a certain amount of cojones to not even have a separate title screen for your game, and instead just putting the title and credits right in the main game screen. This was published by Acclaim, but developed by Imagineering, the same folks who made A Boy and His Blob. Gary Kitchen, an Atari 2600 veteran, is credited as the designer of Destination Earth Star, and Kitchen also worked on a boy in his blob. But while Blob had a certain amount of originality to it, 
Earthstar has absolutely none. Earthstar is one of those games like Dash Galaxy, where the game itself is completely divorced from the plot as described in the manual. It gives you a couple pages of backstory, something about humans captured for a galactic zoo who are now returning to Earth after many years. None of this really matters because it has no connection to anything that happens in-game. Actually playing Destination Earthstar, you'll find no references to the plot, aside from a single sentence of text that appears when you beat the game. If you are familiar with the world of 1980s computer games, you will instantly recognize this as one of the many, many clones of Star Raiders. Star Raiders, of course, being Atari's very successful and influential 1979 computer game. Though Earth Star has one very odd twist, as we'll see later. Now, I'm not sure who, in 1990, wanted a knockoff of an 11-year-old Atari game, but here we are. Earth Star does look nicer than the original Star Raiders for the Atari 800 or 2600, but it does look worse than the 1986 Atari ST version. So here's how you play the game. The map on the left hand side shows all the planets and enemies in the current area that you're in. There's eight areas or star systems or something, and you must clear all of them to beat the game. The O's on the areas represent planets. You can land on them, and you'll sometimes get restocked on your fuel or weapons. The numbers are enemy ships. The number tells you how many enemy ships are in that square. The B is a base, which repairs your ship. And A is the armory, which gives you weapons. The combat is not great. You just fire at these things as they move around all over the place. You have laser beams, which quickly overheat, so you can't just blast enemies non-stop. The entire game is dull and repetitive. Most of the playtime is just simply spent cruising around empty space, going from one point of interest to another. You can go into hyperspace, which makes you move faster around the map, but this also uses up a lot of energy. Among Destination Earthstar's various eccentricities is the control scheme. I mean, not piloting your ship, that's pretty standard. You use the D-pad to move the ship and a button to fire your weapons. But for everything else, instead of using like an options menu, you're required to use various button combinations. So to pause the game, you hit the A and the B buttons at the same time. To remove the map grid, you press B and start. To turn the music off, you pause the game and then unpause and pause the game a second time. This really exposes the computer game roots of Earthstar's design. A keyboard has dozens of keys that you can just bind every action to a different key. Imagineering tried to do the same thing with the NES controller's four buttons, as opposed to just giving it a pause menu like every other NES game. Once you defeated all the enemies in the system, the bad guy's base appears, and you need to land in it, and then... We switch to a horizontal scrolling shoot-em-up. But wow, this looks closer in design to Defender or something than it does to most NES shooters. We have tiny generic sprites, extremely plain backgrounds, very boring weapons. 1990 was the year of shooters like Parodius Da and Special Cybernetic Attack Team. I mean, compared to these, this game looks just absurd. It's also difficult as hell, with tons of enemies trying to ram into you from all sides. I can imagine all the poor kids who got this game as a birthday or Christmas present and not being very pleased with it. All eight star systems are exactly the same, except with more enemies to kill, and it's kind of hard to imagine anyone actually wanting to play all the way through this. But if you did, well, after blowing up the final enemy base, you return to your normal first-person view of the control panel, and the words, The people of Earth welcome you. Home again. And that's it. There's not even any credits since those appeared at the beginning. So, great. Fantastic. What a game.
Hey guys, do you know what we haven't had for a while? A murder mystery adventure game. Nishimura Kyotaro Mystery, Super Express Satsuten Jinken, published by Irem and developed by Toze. And this is actually a pretty stylish intro. Now we've covered many, many, many Satsuken Jiken games, or murder mystery case games, during Crontendo, going all the way back to Portopia, Renzoku, Satsujin Jiken in 1985. And you know, these things don't really change much. Someone is murdered, you play as a detective trying to solve the mystery, and you spend the game looking and asking via the menu on the left-hand side of the screen. In this case, a woman was murdered on a train. Now we saw the first Nishimura Kyotaro game back in episode 41, released in January 1989. Blue Train Satsuken Jiken kind of impressed me with its high quality character artwork and sort of noirish vibe. This game, however, eh, not so much. Possibly the budget was smaller, or Irem just wanted a different look for the game, but the graphics feel a bit more conventional, and it's visually a bit more boring. I suspect it also doesn't include a completely gratuitous panty shot in the game's climax, like the first one did. So, as a reminder, Kyotaro Nishimura was a popular Japanese mystery author who specialized in train-themed mysteries. Aside from his many books, there were a bunch of TV shows and made-for-TV movies, based on his work over the course of around, I don't know, a few decades. The Super Express in the game's title is, I believe, the Bullet Train Express line that runs between Tokyo and Osaka. Anywho, this chick got iced on the train, presumably by strangulation. You go from location to location interrogating witnesses and looking for clues. Like most of these types of games, this pretty much involves just using the look and talk menu options until you unlock additional menu options that allow you to move to a new location and talk to new suspects and witnesses. Most of these Famicom mystery games have never been translated into English, and quite frankly, there's probably not really a whole lot of interest in these things outside of Japan. The Nishimura Kyotaro series released a few more games over the years, well into the DS era, but it seems to have finally petered out a few years ago. Incidentally, there is another Nishimura Kyotaro game for the PC Engine that was released in February 1990. So we'll be covering that in Cron Turbo, and after that, well, we'll be done with the series. So that's some good news. Alright, here's one very unique game, President no Sentaku, meaning President's Choice or President's Decision. And I assume this was a presidential election game of some sort, which was great because we just had an election in November, but nope, it's a different kind of president. This is a simulation game in which you are the president of an automobile manufacturing company. And this, of course, is from the classic team of Hot B and Another, the pair behind Hoshi no Mirohitu, perhaps the worst JRPG on the Famicom, which was recently released on the Switch, which seems a little odd to me, but I guess there is a market for that type of junk. Incidentally, all the music here just seems to be lifted from various classical pieces. First of all, let me say that President no Sentaku is a pretty obscure game and doesn't seem to be particularly well known even in Japan. It doesn't even have a Japanese Wikipedia article, and I found very little discussion of it online. Outside of Japan, of course, no one's heard of it. There's no translations available, and is one of the relatively few Famicom games to not have any sort of guides or reviews on GameFAQs. 
It is very Japanese heavy, making it impossible to play if you aren't reasonably fluent in the language. And also, there's so much stuff going on here that I'd say it's probably pretty hard to play if you don't have the manual. Basically though, as the president, you need to make decisions and give orders to various departments within the company. We have what looks like a research and development team, which you can put points into various attributes of the car. You can also select different types of vehicles to manufacture. And there's what appears to be a marketing department. One nice little detail, maybe the only nice little detail, is that whenever you make a decision like an official seal gets stamped onto the screen. So if this looks like an interesting game, well, apparently it's actually a wretched piece of garbage. The one review I read complained a lot about many aspects of this game. For example, completely random events that you have no control over, such as one of your partner companies going bankrupt, can make it pretty much impossible to win the game and that you might as well reset if that happens. Certain aspects of running the company, like advertising, seem to be totally useless and have no impact on the business. Actually, beating the game is supposedly pretty simple. You just need to focus on pumping out good economy cars and keeping the expenses down and you'll win. To officially beat the game, you need to become the biggest auto manufacturer in Japan and then do the same thing in Europe and finally in the United States. However, apparently, the Europe and US portions of the game are exactly the same as Japan. You basically just start again from the beginning and just have to beat the game two more times. But apparently nothing really has changed from the Japan segment, so it's really boring. And who would want to lose all their progress and then basically have to go through the exact same thing multiple times in a row? Certainly no one, right? Okay, so not much really to say about this game, but there's one last game this episode, and then we'll be done. Well, here we have our last game, and maybe the game I hated the least this episode. Heavy Barrel, from Data East. Your mission? Destroy an underground artillery base. Why don't they just bomb the hell out of the island and then send the guys in to mop it up? And why is this artillery base on an island? Who exactly are they going to shoot at? And what are these things? I was just baffled when I played this for the first time. They don't attack you, and it's not obvious what shooting them does. It turns out hitting them gives you points. Heavy Barrel was originally an arcade game, so the points thing makes sense in that context. But these guys only show up for a few seconds and are then never seen again. Shooting enemies will drop these things that look like turkey basters, but are actually keys. You need them to open the many, many locked boxes found laying around the island, though you can only carry four keys at a time. Heavy Barrel is pretty clearly a clone of Commando, Capcom's 1985 arcade game, which was of course ported to the Famicom in 1986. Heavy Barrel itself debuted in the arcades in 1987. It used a rotary joystick, just like Commando and Akari Warriors did. It was a typical sensory overload arcade shooter, with large number of enemies, lots of explosions, and non-stop gunfire sounds as well as grunts from enemies when they got shot, and an announcer screaming things like go and attack at you. The NES port is less manic, but still pretty action-packed. There is one major change, however. In the arcade game, there are various weapons just lying around that you can pick up to replace your default pea shooter with. They have limited ammo, but ammo refills can be found in locked boxes. And if you lose a special weapon, you'll usually find another weapon or two lying around before too long. In the arcade game, weapons can only be found in locked boxes. And there's lots of locked boxes everywhere. The keys are pretty plentiful, 
but you have no way of knowing what's inside the boxes. By comparison, in Contra, all the pickups are clearly marked. For example, the pickup for the spread gun very clearly has a large S marked on it. In Heavy Barrel, every box looks identical. This is a very vexing design decision, since opening a box has a good probability of replacing your preferred weapon with a less useful one. And this is especially true with the grenades. There are the weak, useless blue grenades and the vastly more powerful red grenades. Losing the red grenades right before a boss fight can be catastrophic. So just like with Contra, the spread gun is the way to go, or rather the pellet gun, as the game calls it. It just slices through groups of soldiers, helicopters, and most non-boss enemies. The first boss here is sort of an armored vehicle with some soldier guys. Just drop a few potatoes on him and he'll go down. I love that after he dies, the ground texture reappears. Heavy Barrel just loves elevator sections. It feels like half the game involves riding on elevators. The second boss is this annoying forklift robot thing. This would be super easy if I had the red grenades, or a weapon other than the standard pea shooter. Now one thing I wanted to show in this video is the heavy barrel itself. The barrel in question is not a barrel like you carry pickles in, but a gun barrel. I guess they incorrectly thought heavy barrel would be a cool sounding name for a big gun? Anyway, the gun has been disassembled and the parts have been hidden in boxes scattered throughout the game. Every time you open a box that contains a heavy barrel part, you will see it be added to that little box in the lower right hand corner. Once you have all six parts, the gun is fully assembled and you can wreak havoc. Though, the heavy barrel is not actually very useful. It shoots a big wide blast of energy or something. Basically, it's an amped up spread gun, but it only lasts for 60 seconds and then disappears. I just happened to get it in a section without many enemies, so it was sort of wasted. Maybe it's best to not worry about the heavy barrel and instead go for the red grenades and the pellet gun. For big, slow-moving bosses, just keep on tossing red grenades at it. I mean, Heavy Barrel is not exactly a terrible game. It's sort of ugly. It lacks the sort of great action set pieces like we saw in Super C. As I mentioned, it's probably the game that I hate least this episode, but there is some annoying stuff. A lot of the run-and-gun games keep your character position in the middle of the screen and the backgrounds just scroll as you move. The classic Super Mario style scrolling. Heavy Barrel allows you to walk around on the screen while the background remains stationary until you get closer to the edge of the screen and then it starts scrolling. Akari 3 also does something very similar. The problem is that when you get close to the edge of the screen, enemies can just pop right in in front of you and you can walk right into them. Here's an egregious example. As you start walking upwards, you get a little bit past the middle of the screen and then, blam, a tank just teleports in right in front of you. The tank is so large, it takes up the upper third of the screen. And it's just so jarring and cheap when this happens. It doesn't scroll smoothly onto the screen. The whole darn thing just appears. And of course, another issue is the boxes. I mean, the contents are not randomized. Each box will contain the same item every time you play the game. As I mentioned before, having the red grenades or the flamethrower is extremely useful for boss fights. So knowing which boxes contain those items is going to give you a pretty big advantage. Keys are limited and you can only hold four at a time, so you can't just go around opening every box until you get what you're looking for. I assume this was added to the game to encourage replayability. Heavy Barrel is pretty damn hard until you've made note of where to find the right weapons. Now as I mentioned, the opening screen says you are infiltrating an enemy base. The actual manual says you are going up against terrorists who have taken over a nuclear missile launch site, which makes a bit more sense. The seventh and final level starts off in a tech base thing, and then goes into some ancient ruins. And then there's this guy on a little pedestal who doesn't really do anything. It appears that you can't harm him, and then he flies away. The 
final boss is this giant mess of pixels with pincer arms. He didn't translate very well to the NES, but in the arcade game he's more clearly recognizable as like a giant mech with a pilot that you can see near the head. Maybe the guy piloting the mech is supposed to be that guy who disappeared a minute ago. Anyway, these fancy mobile armor suits are no match for good old-fashioned American spicy pineapples. Heavy Barrel maybe stays a little bit too true to the arcade game. Aside from the weapons pickups, it's a pretty faithful port, just uglier with fewer enemies and less explosions. It doesn't feel optimized for the Famicom the way Super C did, and the Heavy Barrel itself is kind of disappointing. It's sort of okay, I guess? Anyway, I hope you like this sort of crap, because Ikari 3 is coming up next episode. Alright, that was painful, but we survived. So, best game and worst game? I really don't know where to go with this. Maybe a 10-way tie for the worst game? If I had to pick the best, I'd probably say Heavy Barrel. I mean, it's trash, but it's almost fun. At least when you're not being frustrated by having enemies pop up right in front of your face. And worst game? I guess Destination Earth Star? It's just so boring and just... I don't know, it doesn't even try. It just feels like product, like generic video game. So coming up next, we have at least kind of a strange game from Capcom a port of a rather cute arcade game, and a port of a popular computer game, and, believe it or not, a Famicom Disk System game. It's been a while since we've seen one of those. So, see you next time.